Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speakers, John McCammett and Paul New. Um, John McCammett is a retired professor with the uh, uh, Graduate School of International Studies uh, of the University of Denver. Um, in the 1980s, he and Paul New's father, Ernie, uh, found, uh, organized White Mountain Farm, which has grown and developed quinoa varieties um, since its introduction to the San Luis Valley of Colorado in the 1980s. Um, together, they continue to grow quinoa on White Mountain Farm, and it represents the largest and con uh, longest continuously grown uh, quinoa acreage in the United States. Um, together, they have a, a just a, a large amount of knowledge, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear them talk. We really owe them so much, um, all of us in the United States working on quinoa, and um, I'm really pleased to be able to uh, listen to their talk. So. Uh, I guess I got my climb hooked up. You are? That's the, yeah. okay. <clears throat> well, I, you're probably as exhausted as I am. And uh, maybe I'm older and I get exhausted sooner. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about how we have been working with Kino since uh, 1982 and uh, what has happened. But that's a long story, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit of it. I want to give you, first of all, a little philosophy. I think seeds are extremely important, and they have it all. They know so much more than we do that, uh, you know, a seed can put it in the ground and it develops an extraordinarily complex plant. And we have, you know, some of these people have been studying the germplasm, but they don't know much about that. And uh, so my stress has always been that the seeds will learn and it's not us that learns. And the other thing is that <clears throat> quinoa has a life of its own. It finds us, we didn't find it. And uh, I, if I've done anything at all, it's because I'm a vehicle in this quinoa evolution and not much else. So <clears throat> with that, let me get into the uh, the story that we're involved with. Uh, these are the people that have been working with quinoa in Colorado. And uh, Paul is here, but Ernie and Virginia knew, and uh, Paul and Cindy have also raised three wonderful girls. In the time that we've been here, <laughs> you'll see that we've all aged enormously, but uh, the, I'm really thankful for their help. Um, quinoa was first grown in Colorado in 1982, and it came, uh, the, what was grown came from seed that Steve Gorad, who is, I don't know if he's here now, but he had, there he is, Steve Gorad brought from Chile, they were Isluga and Calcha, and uh, Cusack planted it, but, uh, Steve is probably more of the inspiration for this whole project than anybody else because he had learned in 1978, I guess it was, when it, in a meditation class in Boston that quinoa was good for spiritual work. So he made it his goal, I think, to bring it here. And so much of what, um, and then he and Cusack and another guy formed the Quinoa Corporation, so they started marketing. As you know, the marketing has got way ahead of the production at this point. And uh, so he did that. Uh, Cusack, who was then killed in 1984, and I took over his work. Uh, the production has been much more difficult than the marketing. And uh, so uh, we're here. Uh, <clears throat> I better get over here. Uh, so I, the Cusack formed the Sierra Blanca Associates, and he he came in in August of 1983 after he'd been with Mario Tapia to show Mario Tapia the the quinoa that he had been growing. Some of you knew Mario Tapia, but Mario Tapia wrote the most extensive book about quinoa, and uh, is sort of the leader uh, in South America at that time. 
So Mario Tapia legitimated what was being done. And Cusack came by my house and introduced me to Mario Tapia. And at that time, I think he was knowing that someone had to be able to take over the work that he had started. Um, and so then the next year, he put me on the board of directors of Sierra Blanca. When he was killed, Sierra Blanca board met, and nobody else there was interested in agriculture. And so I, I wanted the project to continue, but it would only continue if I took up. So I did. Not that I had time, but uh, so. And then Sierra Blanca could not raise any money. And so we started a company uh, called <coughs> White Mountain Farm. Uh, and that's been the vehicle for more recent work. Uh, the, uh, we're located in Moscow, Colorado, in the San Luis Valley. It's the highest agricultural area in the country. Uh, it's very hot and dry. Well, it's not, it's at 7,500 feet, it's not too hot, but it's extremely dry and has very strong spring winds. And uh, that's been a problem for us. Um, so Ernie is in the middle there. He and I organized the farm and his son Paul is, was there. Um, uh, this is Sierra Blanca or White Mountain. Uh, and uh, you can see it in the background. So the name of, of our organization comes from that. That's quinoa growing there. Uh, but this is a little bit further north. And you can see the sand dunes there. Uh, that's the uh, sand, Great Sand Dunes National Park. And it comes from wind that blows over our farm and then deposits the sand. And that's been going on for millions of years, I guess. Um, So uh, because we're high, the temperatures are not bad, but we're still marginal on temperature. And I'll talk more about that. Um, fortunately, that area of the United States gets this wet, cool uh, moisture coming in from north, from Mexico and cooling things off. If it comes in time, we get, we're plenty cool. If it doesn't come in time, well, we might lose seed. The important, uh, when I took over, I recognized that uh, Sierra Blanca Associates had a, an enormously valuable collection of seed. Cusack had put that together and it came from all parts of South America. But I think the unique part about this collection of seed, it combined the Southern Chilean seeds with the Andean seeds. And it's been the interaction of those that it, made it so as I was able to develop some pretty good stuff. And then the chenopodium is, uh, the wild chenopodiums are very abundant as well. Um, <clears throat> so I have been planning out a, a research field that is uh, made up of uh, 10 by 25 foot plots. And I've been doing 100, 200, originally I was sometimes went to a 300 plots, but I've been doing it, cutting back more recently. And we harvest it by hand. Uh, I, I stole a clipper cleaner from CSU, and that's what I use to clean the seed. Uh, and uh, it, one of the things is I do taste a lot of the seed. I, I used to taste it all, but uh, before any of the seed goes into a big field for expansion, uh, I make sure that it tastes. And there's a number of very good looking collections that are pretty bland and tasteless that are in my research field, but we aren't gonna grow those out in the big fields. Um, well, back then we, we thought things were gonna go gangbusters. And uh, so we organized the Quinoa Producers Association. They came to Moscow and they had a meeting and Paul was elected the first president, and it turned out he was the last president too, because none of the producers could produce. And so 
that uh, optimism kind of decline. Um, the, I want to talk about what is probably the most important seed collection that we started with. It, it was what uh, Cusack designated Colorado 407. And uh, it's actually not in our collection as such. Now, what was planted here is, I call a derivative. It's much changed from this, but um, it has a typical sort of orange yellow color. And uh, that's what it looks like. Here is um, a single plant that blew out of the irrigated area, but back in the 80s, we were a little wetter and, and it, it grew pretty well with no irrigation, but it's also a good example of what the head looks like. Uh, in 1983, before I was involved, Cusack wrote in a notebook that I have, that this variety matured before all the others. It had large compact heads of a brilliant orange gold color, maybe the most promising variety planted this year. Well, it did prove to be the most promising. Um, so it provided the first large field productions in Colorado. And then out of that, I've developed, it has developed, I don't want to say I developed. Kenema develops itself. And the, I only stand as a witness to it. Uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I don't breed it. It, it does itself. Um, so it, there's two lines that have come from that that are, are pretty exceptional. The quinoa, the 407 originally, was small and dark seeded. It was very tasty, but it, uh, it didn't look at all like what uh, was in the market. So we grew it for a few years, and then we kind of quit. But in that time, we had these exceptional plants uh, in the 407 field that had purple heads. They, uh, the first year, they were about two feet taller than the rest of the 407. And uh, they had dark seeds. So I collected a lot of those, grew them out, and uh, <clears throat> they segregated it into everything. So he had high, short, uh, long mature and short mature and this sort of thing. But out of this, I've been working with this 407 black, <clears throat> which is a, a lovely plant. Now, in this particular field, which is about four years ago, I finally got some very large seeded black. But in the next two years, it hasn't reproduced particularly well. So. But this is just uh, what it looks. Oh, back to that. It's not just purple heads because you can see there's a green head that has very black seeds, and they actually the head color is just about everything. Um, so uh, after we'd grown it in the field a few years, we discontinued it and and grew. Uh, only the, the larger white seeded material. <clears throat> and then when we grew a 30 acre 407 field again, I was walking it and I discovered that there were plants in there that had large seeds that were a wider color basically. And so I saved those and worked with them, <clears throat> growing them out in the research field. And I, uh, Research, this is in my research field. These I've been growing out and selecting from, and I'm st we're still working with it. Um, now, Lepus is the name of the uh, seed from southern Chile, the, the salt flats area. Um, and Cusack went in 1983 to the Quinoa Festival there. and. He was very impressed with the culture, the seed, and the, and he brought back s several hundred pounds of it. And uh, he was able to find several farmers in the San Luis Valley to grow it. And uh, then he was killed in uh, June of 84. <clears throat> and the plants, the fields were already planted, but none of them produced. 
there were zero quinoa plants to be grown out of all those fields. And uh, so that's how I began, uh, a, a less optimistic view than what Cusack had. Uh, but I was, I was getting possibilities of growing test fields in higher elevations, and we grew that seed out. And uh, when we brought it back to the San Luis Valley, it did produce. This is what it looked like in those first years. Uh, so most strongest plants we've ever had, big green headed and then turn, at maturity turning yellow. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the climate in the San Luis Valley was getting warmer, and uh, we had a couple of years when nothing, uh, the, this would not grow at all. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> Ernie had always planted some of the quinoa separate from what I was planting, and he planted some in the vegetables. And they were, it was enough cooler that there was nine of the stuff that he planted that survived. And I've been, then I put that in the research field and we've been working with it. And uh, we have a, something that is shorter, weaker, not like the original leaf, it's what we call it short blanca. <clears throat> it is clearly part of the line of, of the, what was started as the leaf. And uh, these are what it looks like. And this is one of our major limes that we grow out. It's worked really well for us. And haven't had a heat problem with it, but who knows? Um, now, the, this is a different development. Uh, Steve Dorad brought back some seed from southern Chile, and I'm not sure where he got it, but it was called Cowheel. And we grew it out, and it was about as good as the 407 in terms of its adaptation. And uh, it had a sort of a purple plant and a green plant that always came out, and uh, uh, and it uh, it was it was tasty. It wasn't as tasty as the 407, but it had a cleaner taste. And uh, we grew it in bigger fields for a while because I thought it'd be good for flour, but the, we didn't market flour, so. Uh, I kept it going in the research field, and uh, then it was uh, in the early 2000s, I saw that there were some of it began to have some big seeds, and when the big seeds, you know that the Andean material is getting mixed in, and, uh, and actually when I grew out these plants that had the big seed, they they segregated the way a hybrid segregates, and uh, I've been working with that. And I, it's it's a really nice line, and I'm I've got maybe 15 different selections out of it that I keep growing. Uh, so here is this is what it looks like now, and the Kawil that was we saw yesterday is the Kawil cross. It's not Kawil. It's not at all like what Steve brought back. Um, and it's still sort of combining and doing interesting things. So we'll see. Um, now, up here, you'll see the top of a 1983 uh, no, Volvo station wagon that uh, took me back and forth. Because I had to, I lived in Denver. My research field was 2,000 or 202 miles away. And so we made lots of trips together. And in the end, I, it wouldn't drive in the mountains this last year. So I donated it to Colorado Public Radio. Uh, so we have four lines that are entirely different than anything that came from South America. Uh, the quinoa did this thing itself. It developed itself to some material that is much better adapted to where we are growing. And uh, I, th I think they're all good. The 407 Black is also extremely popular. Uh, but they're all good. And they're better than what was brought up from South America. And I think the, the 
what was good was that uh, they came from very different regions and uh, grew up in our climate. So we still got lots of production problems. Uh, I, if someone wanted me to say definitively that quinoa would grow in the San Luis Valley, I, I wouldn't give a strong answer. Um, but Paul is the one who grows the quinoa. Uh, he's, he's grown more quinoa than has been grown in all, by everybody else in the United States put together, but quite a bit. And he also cleans it and markets it. So I'll turn this over to him. There we go. Before I get started, I just really would like to thank Kevin and uh, Washington State University staff for the, the conference here. Uh, the, we've been at this for, well, almost 30 years, John a little longer than that, and I have not seen this type of passion and commitment for 25 of that. <laughs> so we felt like we're kind of on an island out there. So just the opportunity to connect with the experts, the scientists, the, the plant breeders, uh, makes me feel really good and positive. Maybe it's gonna work after all. <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot to add actually to what's been said. Uh, my main focus has been to develop quinoa on a large scale basis for a commercial type farm. Uh, our farm is all organic, we've been growing it uh, since 87. Uh, we've had all the challenges and problems that I think you've already heard about. I don't have a lot to add to that. The deer and the elk have been a problem. Uh, when we first started, even our first several years, equipment availability, just the simple getting a combine to the field on time. We had a year, we had one of our better crops. There was, I had 60 acres of beautiful quinoa and we were relying on a custom combiner to come in and combine it. And I call him and says, oh, I'll be there as soon as we finish, as soon as we finish. And this carried on for, for probably a week. And we happened to have a, a, a pretty strong windstorm one night. And the next day, it really didn't matter when he showed up because it was all on the ground. So we've dealt with that. Uh, we've had our problems with different insects, uh, different than what we've talked about. But insects, nevertheless, that... I'm sure every, wherever you grow up, we're gonna run into uh, new insects, new problems. Uh, fertility, we fought with the fertility. Uh, like I said, we are an organic farm. Unfortunately, we had to uh, kind of make a living or the banker wouldn't let us keep trying it. So I've spent a lot of time developing potatoes in that business. So unfortunately, I haven't had the time to spend on the chemo research I would have liked. But so sometimes our best fields had to be dedicated to other production just so we could stay in business. Uh, heat stress, although heat stress, I think, is definitely it, it's not just heat stress that you'll see affecting seed set. It's a definite problem, but it's a combination of heat stress, fertility, watering. Uh, all of these factors play together. Variety, obviously, which we've talked about a lot. Uh, the probably the biggest problem that I see usually faced is weed control. Uh, you have you have to, we row crop all of ours. Uh, if you don't keep the weeds out of it, particularly when it's very small, uh, quinoa won't, will not outcompete the weeds. Uh, most recently, uh, my our biggest problem most recently is John was showing with the location of the sand dunes there is early damage from the wind. The sand actually blowing across our fields when my quinoa is only an inch or an inch and a half tall, just after it comes up. It just won't withstand the wind. Uh, I have tried several different things. We uh, uh, strip crop it, and actually that works. You know, I'll plant a cover crop early or even the fall before using winter rye in an effort to basically develop some wind breaks that I can plant the quinoa between. And my, my strips are uh, 75 to 100 feet wide, and they actually work fairly well unless the wind decides to blow exactly parallel with my wind strips and then it doesn't work at all. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing some intercropping now, uh, trying to actually uh, pre-plant some type of cover crop and plant quinoa into that uh, fairly new process for us, uh, but it, it, it has lots of promise, I think. Um, 
generally speaking, I, we grow our quinoa on 18-inch uh, rows so that I can cultivate it. Uh, we plant somewhere between four and six pounds an acre. Uh, I have tried different uh, methods. We sometimes solid standard broadcast it or drill it with an alfalfa seeder. Uh, normally, the biggest problem I run into that is weed control. Um, we use just a standard, uh, I've got an old, old TR85 New Holland combine that we, uh, you can, just a standard combine. It actually works pretty well. It's got lots of duct tape on it so that the quinoa seed doesn't run out of the cracks, but uh, it, it does work well. So that some of the, the some of the equipment is not very specialized. Some of it is. I use a, a vegetable planter to plant it. I have used drills. I like the vegetable planter because I can control the depth so much better. Uh, let's see what else did I gonna... uh, after after it's harvested. We, uh, we do process it and package it on the farm there. Uh, we run it through a barley deholing machine, which is the abrasive machine. It's a cone-shaped stone uh, fit inside of a cone-shaped screen. The, the cone is spinning inside that screen. And there's just a little space between there so that, that abrasive stone actually breaks that sapin and coating off. Then we run it through a white a rice whitening or rice polisher after that to kind of finish it off. We don't use any water. We keep ours dry, uh, mostly because I, I don't have a way of drying it and keeping it, and I didn't want to get into the washing process. So on our label, uh, if, if you were to buy our quinoa, on the label it states be sure to walk to rinse before using it. And uh, if you don't, it will remind you there's still a little satin and dust on there, and it's a little bitter. So that it's important. Uh, it's, it'll be something to deal with as we go into different products that'll have to be washed before they can be used. We sell the majority of our quinoa to two small distributors, one, one in the Denver area and one in the Albuquerque area. I can't produce enough for either one of them. Uh, I have lots of people obviously interested in it, but we can't really keep up with the demand just in the Colorado, uh, New Mexico area. Uh, I do sell a little over the internet or well, not really mail order, uh, but most of it goes to those uh, distributors. Unfortunately, I'm already out this year. And that's been the problem I've faced for years. Uh, my, my, my rotation, my crop rotation, it's, it's important to, when you're thinking about chemo, how it fits in your cropping system. It is not just, you don't just grow chemo. Uh, my rotation is potatoes. Uh, then I usually throw a green manure crop or cover crop in of some type followed with quinoa and then a, a, another green manure cover crop. I've, I've used three and four year rotations. We do grow some alfalfa as well once in a while to break up the rotation. I have a few vegetables, but that's my general, uh, my, my, my main rotation is the potato quinoa green manure. So I'd kind of just like to open it up for specific questions rather than just ramble on. And, and if there's something I can answer or try to answer, uh, I don't have all the answers. Otherwise, all my neighbors would already be growing it, and they're not. 